So welcome everyone to the Colonial Society's March meeting. I am Bob Allison, the president of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts. And I am really delighted to welcome tonight my good friend, Peter Mancall. Peter Cooper Mancall has been teaching at the University of Southern California now for 20 years. He received his bachelor's degree at Oberlin College and then his doctorate in history at Harvard. And he is the Andrew Mellon Professor of the Humanities and the, a professor of history and anthropology and the Linda and Harlan Marlene Direct, Martin, Director of the USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute. He's a prolific scholar. His first book was on Indians and alcohol, deadly medicine, Indians and alcohol in early America. And he's written, written about Richard Haku and about Henry Hudson's voyages and uh, a variety of other topics. Currently, he is working on volume one of the Oxford History of the United States, a book that will be called American Origins. And he's here to talk to us tonight about his most recent book, The Trials of Thomas Morton, an Anglican lawyer, his Puritan foes, and the battle for a New England. And he's also offering a discount from the publisher for Thomas Morton, The Trials of Thomas Morton, which I can say is a terrific book. So it belongs on the shelves of every scholar, everyone interested in early American history. So I'm really delighted to have you with us tonight. So please welcome Peter Mankell. Well, Bob, thank you very much. I, I wish I was there with you in Boston. I wish actually all of us were in a room. I know that some of you have chimed in are, are friends of mine uh, and I'm really delighted that you're here. The book is, is uh, I, I will I will own the faults, but I will say that uh, many of the what I hope are the strong parts really are because of conversations I've had with early Americanists for my entire career. And I'm really delighted to be here uh, to talk about uh, my uh, new ish <laughs> new book came out um, at the end of 19 in the U.S. It came out uh, early last year uh, when I was in England. It came out in London, I think, in January February. And I want to emphasize as I get started, um, one thing about the title of my book. Um, the subtitle, you know, it's, it's called The Trials of Thomas Morton because this is a book about a lawyer. Uh, Thomas Morton, I think to a lot of people on this crowd, you probably have some sense of him. Thomas Morton has one of the great cameos in American history where he quite literally seems to dance on and off the stage of William Bradford's Up Plymouth Plantation. Um, you know, and, and that aspect of Morton has been much discussed for hundreds of years. And I'll be talking about the legacy of Morton later on in this little presentation. But the subtitle of my book is really important and I wanna emphasize it. Um, an Anglican lawyer, Morton, his Puritan foes, the people he battled and I'm lumping together, the Pilgrims of New Plymouth and the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay and the battle for a New England. And I really wanna emphasize that sort of indefinite article there what Morton has had in mind was to create a new version of England in North America. And to read him now, and will be, as I'll be doing you know, today, is to always remember that context, that that's what he has in mind. So let me just take you, take you very briefly, as in for about a minute, to how I got to this project and hope this PowerPoint will work appropriately. And of course, now it's not working. Oh, there we go, sorry about that. This book of mine I see less as a work of biography than a work of microhistory. And it comes for me as sort of a natural progression of work I've been doing for about the past 20 years. I think my friend Mary Fuller is out there in the audience. Mary is one of the world's great experts on Hacklet. But, you know, in, early, in 2007, I published a book on Richard Hacklet called Hacklet's Promise, a book that has elements of biography to it, but is really a microhistory trying to understand um, a problem, an issue is, you know, why did the English decide to colonize North America when they did and, and how did they do so? I followed that a couple of years later with a study of Henry Hudson. Uh, I, that book came out timed for the 400th anniversary of Hudson's arrival in um, what's now New York. Uh, I don't know if you read my book, but I, that actually is a very minor part of it because what interests me about Hudson's story is what happens on his fourth and of course, as you can tell in the title, does not go well, his final journey uh, in 1610, 1611. I saw that as sort of a way to work out problems about, again, how does this one European population, the English, contemplate 
exploration and colonization of an area that they understand very poorly. In other sort of related works I've done over the years, I've been really concentrating my efforts on the period of the last generation, last decades of the 16th century and the first decades of the 17th century. Uh, really trying to make English colonization of North America more of a, a problem, frankly, um, you know, to really situate it in its time. Uh, as I was, as, as Bob and I were talking earlier, um, you would have, you know, knocked me over literally with a feather three years ago if you had said that the American population would get consumed with the year 1619. Uh, but of course, it's no secret to anyone here that we've had deep uh, discussions in this country about the meaning of the early 17th century. And the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrim's arrival at Patuxet has spawned enormous and incredibly fertile uh, conversation uh, that really has been probing and digging at the heart of the encounter between the English on the one side and indigenous peoples of, of the land that now we now know as New England on the other. And there's been so much great scholarship about this, especially with New England Quarterly, a recent issue of early American literature, a new edition of Bradford's Up Invitation by the Colonial Society. I mean, really it's sort of having its moment. My study of Morton is, you know, sort of appears in the midst of that moment I hope is part of that conversation, but it's not centrally about that moment. It's really my attempt to use Morton to tell the story of this one person, this is somewhat, I think, unlikely story, to reveal deeper truths or deeper meaning, I should say, maybe that's a better word than truth, about the early 17th century and about this particular period. So the area where my book is set is the area that we now, uh, typically referred to as New England, whose indigenous populations in various ways refer to it as uh, the dawn land or the place where the day begins. Uh, and I want to immediately give a shout out, this map appears in my book, a shout out to the way to conceptualize this map, uh, to literary scholar Lisa Brooks, whose you know, uh, amazing new history of Metacoms or King Philip's War is, is really worth a deep read. And in that book, Professor Brooks talks about the meaning of, of spaces. And so I wish that book had been out earlier. It would have shaped even more of the early parts of mine, but it is, I want to really recommend it as a terrific read. But this is the physical territory where much of what I talk about in the book um, takes place. There is a sense, uh, I think among many, especially more casual readers of the American past, that this area that we now call New England was always going to be colonized by the English. So besides the fact that I, I start the book by talking about the fact that this is already a well-settled place um, of, of Algonquian-speaking, multiple Algonquian-speaking peoples who I you know, loosely identified you know, on this map. And it's very important for me to sort of emphasize that at the start because I really want to situate my story of Morton as Morton arriving in this place that was already settled. I don't use the word settler to refer to colonists because I don't, I think that since the land was already settled, that's a term that doesn't mean much to me or is not useful for how I talk about it. Morton certainly does want to impose a new order on this area, but he does, as you'll know if you know his work, he has different ideas than the Pilgrims and Puritans. But crucially, his is not, and, and the Pilgrims is not the first story that we know about, about this region from a European. Champlain travels through this area, goes to the place where, which the English would later christen as New Plymouth, and describes it. I use this map in my book to make a very important point. Regardless of what some Europeans might have thought about going into an unsettled place, it's fairly evident that European observers of this very place saw it as a populated landscape, a populated and cultivated landscape, uh, a landscape that it some of them believed could become a New England because in many ways it was a version of it, a very different version. The English wanted to change it, but nonetheless, it was there. And of course, the story that I tell about Thomas Morton needs to be situated into the larger English colonization and conquest of Eastern North America. So Morton is not you know, the first person to appear on the scene. He's not the last person there on the scene, but he is there, he is there at a certain particular moment. And that moment is really what my book, it talks about. So Morton, sorry, before, shortly before Morton goes, John Smith in his map, which I imagine everyone on this call probably knows, gives this area, this name, 
New England. It becomes the dominant name, obviously, in the way that the English would understand it. There are, I talk about this in the book, people within England who are competing, who have rival claims for it. In fact, that's one of the major sub-themes of my book is which English population could legitimately claim to lay claim to this area. Um, so that's sort of the pretext. And now let me bring Morton briefly onto the stage. I mean, there are a number of details about him. I don't consider my book a biography because I don't have a lot of the details about his life. I, we make certain, I make certain guesses. There's been a lot of terrific scholarship on him, really helped me write my book, uh, that there've been so many people doing it. Um, but there's a lot we don't know. I don't know what he looked like. In some sense, I sort of you know joke with my friends. This is the third micro story I've written in a row of putting person at the front that we don't know what they look like. We don't really know what, we don't know what Hacklett looked like. We don't know what Hudson looked like. We don't know what Morton looked like. Would it change my story if I knew what they looked like? Probably not, but it is sort of a, a sense of their place in the society at the time that we in fact don't have images that survive of them. Thomas Morton in uh, 1620 meets a woman named Alice Miller, a widow. He is her lawyer. And he, mar he, he meets her and then fairly soon they get married. And Alice Miller has several children, the oldest one of whom, George Miller Jr. after his then late father, doesn't like Thomas Morton very much. In fact, he hates Thomas Morton. And the first way that Morton really becomes known is in legal records about a dispute about an estate in Swallowfield in Wiltshire. I talk about that dispute uh, near the beginning of, of the book. Uh, this dispute begins uh, in the early 1620s, uh, the same time that other people in England are thinking about this area that Smith has now christened New England. And among people thinking about it is a man named Sir Ferdinando Gorgias uh, from the Council of New England, founded in 1606, who believes that he and his company have a legitimate claim to New England. And they're very concerned about other English, the pilgrims, going there. In the midst of his own legal dramas in 1622, I think, or not positive, I don't think any scholars can know for certain, Thomas Morton seems to make a brief round trip uh, to what the pilgrims have now called Plymouth. And he goes back to Swallowfield. The legal dispute continues to engulf him. Uh, it looks like he might win, but it's unclear. It's certainly clear that he has now become, uh, he starts to have um, conversation and form a partnership with Gorgias. And, for, and that partnership with Gorgias would be important for the rest of Morton's life. Um, in 1624, Morton abandons Alice Miller, abandons this whole legal dispute, and goes over to New Plymouth. Uh, moving into um, a recently abandoned, what is typically referred to as a fur trading post of a Captain Wollaston um, uh, near, near Plymouth. And from then on, he sort of becomes uh, the bane of William Bradford's existence. And in fact, we know much about Morton. In fact, Morton is most famous because of what Bradford wrote about him, especially these sort of epic scenes in 1627 and 1628 where Bradford describes, and if you know a Plymouth Plantation, I'm not gonna rehearse this because I think this is an audience that probably knows that text. Bradford, you know, describes what he sees as uh, a raucous scene of Morton having two friendly relations uh, with native peoples in the area, providing guns and ammunition to them, drinking alcohol with them, dancing with them, dancing around a maypole. And all of this eventually is just too much for Bradford. Uh, you know, one of those sort of dramatic moments in a Plymouth plantation, you know, he uses the moniker, you know, uh, Lord of Misrule, he applies this to Morton, and they go and they, uh, he and his uh, pilgrims arrest Morton and ship him back to England, where he is convinced, it's 1628 Bradford is convinced, Morton's going to spend a long time in jail. Oh, turns out, not so much the case. Morton, in fact, <laughs> returns uh, in 1629. He comes over now joining uh, the New Massachusetts Bay Colony where he sort of characteristic to a man who of course had a legal dispute with the children of his wife, had a huge falling out with the governor of Plymouth, then of course gets into a big battle with, uh, with John Winthrop. And so the Puritan uh, leaders of Massachusetts Bay, they don't like him very much either. So they decide to exile him. So Morton goes back to England. Now, if you're keeping track, this is his third journey eastward, if you believe as I do that he went 
briefly back and forth in 1622, but his second exile. So now he has been kicked out and he goes back to Massachusetts, he goes back to London and he is very unhappy. And now he really starts to, to partner with Gorgias because now he's really motivated. And they start to work on a, on a case um, against Winthrop. Now, I, I should have popped this slide from the Winthrop, even before Morton arrives, Winthrop is already suspicious about Morton because Winthrop, before he left England, had heard about an allegation of murder against a Thomas Morton of Swallowfield, presumably the same Thomas Morton, in a rather indistinct reference in the past about Morton's possible involvement in the death of a man, a case that is never solved. So Morton is back in England. Winthrop, Winthrop is, is still in Massachusetts. And Morton starts to, to partner with Fernando Gorgias. And they start to hatch a very elaborate plan um, to get the Massachusetts Bay Charter back. Now, Morton, as this is going on, writes a book, the book that we would later know as New English Canaan. But we have records from the time that indicate that the book was destroyed, it was suppressed. Um, and so we know that Morton has written something, this will come back into the story, written something, but it is not published. So Martin is doing that. He's also working as, as, as he's also working with, um, with Gorgias on this legal case. And this case makes its way forward in the legal system. Uh, and eventually Gorgias, Gorgias and Morton convince uh, the Privy Council, the King's Bench and Charles I that they're in the right, that Gorgias' claim dating from 1606, 1607 is superior to the claim of the Massachusetts Bay Company. And so they say, this document, this piece of parchment must be returned to London, right? And we know that because the legal record tells us of the so-called quo warranto case, a case which is by what warrant do you have to go there? We know that Morton and Gorgeous win the case. <laughs> wow, that's a fairly big moment and it sort of falls a little bit away from our standard story of what's going on in uh, Puritan New England. So basically, this is what's happening and Gorgias decides, okay, now is the moment and maybe, maybe now would they have to have an armed invasion. And so Gorgias fits out a gigantic, essentially battleship. Unfortunately for Gorgias, according to the one report we have, it sinks at the docks. So military invasion doesn't work. Word gets back to Massachusetts. You have to send back the charter and the people in Massachusetts, the authority of the general court says, yes, thank you, but no, thank you. So they decide to hold on to it. Right? So they have defied uh, the king. This, of course, fuels Morton, Morton's sort of passion and Gorgias's passion. Now, other information is circulating, and part of what I do in the book is to try to situate Morton in his time. And a book that many of us in this call will know, uh, William Wood, New England's Prospect, first edition comes out in 1634. Morton, remember, tried to publish his book in 31, 32, had it suppressed. Wood's book comes out, Morton hates Wood's book. And when he would eventually publish New England's Canaan, he would make these cutting remarks about William Wood. He thinks William Wood is getting it all wrong. And what he doesn't like in part is that William Wood is fairly, uh, he doesn't have strong opinions about the Puritans who Morton and Gorgias simply despise at this point. While Morton is in England, the event that we refer to typically as the Pequot War erupts again. Bradford gives a particular vivid, horrific rendering of this in a Plymouth Plantation, a famous, infamous rendering of it. It's information about what happens, you know, the banks of the Mystic circulates across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we could, if in the question and answer, we can talk about this. Morton does not observe this. But I think that this event obviously was what Morton feared. Morton feared that the Puritans by not listening to what he had in mind about how people could coexist in New England would lead to exactly this kind of result. So I believe that Morton sees this as tragedy, but Morton is still not there. Morton is still in England as, the, as these terrible events are unfolding in North America in 1637. That year, Morton does get his book published. It's published in Amsterdam. I'm not showing you just any copy of this book, I'm showing you one specific copy of this book, which is what the the, page, the last part of my book is on, that's the, the circulation of Morton's story. This is John Quincy Adams' copy. If we were in Boston, I suppose we could walk uh, over to the Athenaeum and maybe pull out the copy 
and we could physically see that. Of course, I'm talking to you from Los Angeles um, and we're not there, but this is the physical copy. I'm gonna come back to this copy in a while, but, but this book comes out. New English Canaan, again, a text I imagine is well known to many people on this call. New English Canaan is uh, a book that is now read some, used, as a source quite a lot, certainly by historians, and I think by literary scholars, but sort of not read in the same way that we read of Plymouth Plantation or other sorts of texts, in part because it's a, it's, it is to us somewhat, uh, it's, I don't wanna say it's a strange book, I mean, that doesn't seem like a fair thing, but it's, 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 it, it falls, it's different from most of the texts we have from early New England. But it is in fact a classic form in some sense of a, of a travel report. In this, in this account, Morton tells, you, tells his readers, he's gone over to this place. He has befriended some of the local peoples. He has come to speak to them and he claims understand them. He describes conflicts between them and the pilgrims and Puritans. He provides a sort of loose ethnography of what these Algonquin speaking peoples, how they live. He provides, uh, like many travel reports, he provides details about the enormous number of resources that could be extracted from this area. So if you remember, I'm sure people on this call know, you know, uh, William Cronin's changes in the land, you know, Wilderness can turn to Mart. Cronin, among others, used Morton um, as a source uh, for understanding how the English understood resource and bustle resource extraction in early New England. But Morton, unlike a typical travel report, ends his, his book with an attack on the on the Puritans, um, mocking them in some sense, but really criticizing them. It's a very harsh portrayal. Remember, he is in England, he's written this. He believes they have suppressed the first printing of this book. He gets it published in Amsterdam uh, and now it exists. So now the book physically exists. I'll hold off on that picture for a moment. Sorry, didn't mean to tease you too much. The book physically exists. Skipping ahead a few years, I sort of described this, Morton decides to come back. Um, he decides to come back and, and to see what he can do in Massachusetts. Uh, 1639, Gorgeous cuts a deal. Uh, people in, in Maine probably are experts on this. Gorgeous cuts a deal where he believes he is then gonna own what we think now of the state of Maine. That would be Gorgeous's territory. I'll talk about this a bit in the book. 1643, a few years later, Gorgeous is too old to travel, but Morton decides to come over and he goes right back to Boston and Winthrop describes him. What Morton doesn't know is that his book got there before him and the Puritans read the book and they saw that Morton was their enemy, that he had, as Winthrop put, as Winthrop put it, written a book against us. So he, Morton arrives and the Puritans put him in jail. He's in jail for about a year, possibly. And they're trying to figure out basically what to charge him with. And with the rights at one point in his journal, you know, we could have beaten him, but he was old, you know, old and sorry. And what was the point of that? So in 1644, they decide to exile him. But rather than send him back to England, Morton this time instead goes north. He goes to Agamenticus or Agamenticus. This, this place where Gorgeous had hoped to set up his plantation. It's in modern York, Maine. And he goes, and so far as we know, he died there, I have to say. I did go looking for his grave and all of the graves from that generation seem to be just mixed with others. So you can't find them, but I think everyone would agree that Morton is probably there. In some sense, that should have been the end of my story, right? I've written up, I've, I've sort of told the story of this man and his travails. But the thing about Morton, this guy who the pilgrims hated, who the Puritans hated, he really fascinated them. And so people start to write to him and his story keeps circulating. So in one of those sort of odd quirks of thing, Bradford, by going on telling the world about what he was like, Bradford helps keep Morton in the news, as it were. Now, Bradford's manuscript, as you know, is not published in his lifetime. It's not published till the 19th century. But that manuscript circulates across New England. It, 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 it gives depth uh, to Nathaniel Morton, uh, that's Bradford's nephew, not Thomas Morton, uh, Nath Nath Tom, sorry, Bradford's nephew, to his New English Memorial, and it remains in this thing. And so Morton's story, Thomas Hutchinson tells Morton's story. People seem to tell through the 18th century, 
then get to the end of the 18th century. John Adams has become president of the United States. He, and he has a conversation, written conversation with Washington, deciding to keep to have John Quincy Adams remain as basically an ambassador uh, in Germany, what's now Germany. And while John Quincy is there, he goes to an auction and he buys this copy of this book. Now, I have to tell you, there are maybe 25 or so copies of this book left. So it's not the rarest book that we have, but it's also not a common book. It hadn't been in print by that time in, in 200 years. So John Quincy Adams buys this book. He brings it back home, back, brings it back to Braintree, where then it seems every member of the Adams family starts to read this book. Uh, so they, the Adams family, starts to talk about this book in the early 19th century. They write about it in their diaries. So John Adams, after he's done being president, after Jefferson is done being president, this is how I opened my book, he and Jefferson start writing back and forth in that, that beautiful series of letters that they have, including <laughs> questions about Thomas Morton. Um, as Adams is writing a history of his hometown and he's trying to find out more about Wollaston and he comes to the conclusion that where Morton was, was exactly on the lands where the Adams family then has. So it's one of these you know, quirks of things. So they write back and forth. So here's Thomas Morton getting a new life again. The book is still sitting in the library there. Members of the Adams family uh, read it. Eventually John Quincy Adams, who just picked it up, it seemed almost as a curiosity. Eventually he would read it. Charles Francis Adams reads it right before uh, his senior year at, at Harvard and it sort of, it speaks to him. There's something in it that speaks to him. And then eventually that book, this copy of that book would fall into the hands of Charles Francis Adams Jr. Famous in a lot of ways that people on this call know actually better than I do, who would then do a modern edition of it. But before that happens, John Adams, in a manuscript that's at the, at the MHS, John Adams decides he's gonna write essentially a local history. And he draws extensively on Morton. In fact, he writes out long passages from New English Canaan in his history as he's trying to understand history. So this, this manuscript is never published. Um, and someday when the Adams Papers gets to that point, uh, I, I assume they'll do a, a nice uh, part of it, but it's, a, it's really an interesting story. We could talk about this version of it. I mean, Morton now is sort of known. People are talking about him, the antiquarian Samuel Drake, who publishes a book about history and antiquities of Boston, uh, talks about Morton. And then this picture, this is the picture on the cover of my book. That picture is in a footnote in, in Drake's history. And it's not to illustrate Morton per se, it's to illustrate Bilbo's because Morton is kept confined in Bilbo's, these shackles at his feet. So I am making the imaginative authorial leap that this is Drake's sort of version of what Morton might have looked like. I don't know. But anyway, that's what the picture is. It's to illustrate actually what's around his ankles, not the person, but since it's in a footnote about Morton. Uh, Drake uh, gets really obsessed with New English Canaan. He borrows, as far as I know, the Adams family copy. And in a, on a rainy week in Boston, not that there are many of those, he decides he is going, remember it hasn't been printed since 1637. He hand copies the entire manuscript. That manuscript, his handwritten version of the 1637 edition is at the Clements Library. Now, um, Morton now is beginning to find known. So 19th century historians are writing about him. And, and what everybody focuses on, what many people focus on is the story of Bradford and the Maypole. It's the most dramatic moment they think in Morton's life. It's the one that's most accessible because of the accessibility eventually of, of Plymouth Plantation. And so this becomes sort of the dominant story. But eventually Charles Francis Adams does his edition for the Prince Society in 1883. This becomes, there are, there are recent editions, but this becomes sort of then the standard edition that people, that people know. And it's got an amazing preface to it. If you ever have a chance to read, I talk about this in my book, the preface. The preface to this is Charles Francis Adams at the end of the 19th century, late 19th century, talking about how difficult it is to understand Morton because it's such a learned book. So he consults a raft of people, mostly in the Boston area, almost all of them associated with Harvard. At one point he mentions that one person was associated with Yale, you know, as if he was sort of intellectual slumming, well, let's have someone from New Haven. Bob. But he hits all of these famous people in 19th century, in 19th century Boston to help, help me understand this place so I could do an apparatus to this book. So now the book has yet a new life. It had been reprinted 
earlier in, in forces tracks, it's sort of an unannotated edition, but now it's, it's catching on. And then it moves forward into the 20th century and, and um, the great artist E.J. Barnes, who I hope is, is on this call, um, did this wonderful version uh, of, of Morton and, and, and I'm very happy uh, that I was able to use um, E.J.'s image in the book of Morton dancing around the Maypole. Uh, Morton, Morton reviled in the 17th century, discovered as, sort of rediscovered as a curiosity in the 19th century, becomes in the 20th century, this sort of almost cultish literary figure, an anti-hero picked up by various authors, sort of maybe most famously by Philip Roth um, in The Dying Animal, in which if you know this very sort of angry little novella, I have to say, um, has this departure where he talks about, he drops Thomas Morton into the middle of a, of a story, of a professor telling um, a story. In what I think everyone in the 17th century would have been frankly the most shocked about, in 2011, the governor of Massachusetts, uh, Deval Patrick, declares Thomas Morton Day. Okay. So a man who was exiled three times from New England for basically being in the face of first the Pilgrims and then the Puritans, now in the 21st century is seen as a great sort of um, celebrator of nature, of someone whose view towards indigenous peoples of this region was much more positive than those of uh, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, and someone now to be commemorated. It is, it was one of these sort of, you know, archival discoveries that you, <laughs> I, you know, never expect um, to find. So the book, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll do my best to answer questions, but that's essentially what it is. My book is a, a micro history. And just as one final note, um, as a number of you will know, Within the past few months, uh, my mentor, someone obviously very well known to the Kona Society, Bernard Balin, passed away. And after his death, a number of people wrote to me and asked me, did I write this book in the spirit of, of Bud's The Ordeal of Thomas Hutchinson? And I have to say that that was not actually front and center on my mind, but now looking back on it, I do wonder if, it was, if I wasn't in some way wrestling with what I think is a really stunning work, one of Bud's great works. So I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's sort of what my book is about. So thank you for being here. Great, thank you so much, Peter. This is a great explication. And if people have questions, you can type them into the chat or the Q&A or raise your hand. We do have the capacity to elevate you people so they will be able to speak if your question is too lengthy. Uh, we did have a question from John Emery, who wanted to know if you could talk at all about Morton and music. There's an opera by uh, Hanson, there's a ballet. Uh, this is part of, I think, the cultural figure of Morton. Could you tell us a little bit more? I wish I could, but I, but I, <laughs> I, am, I am not the person. That's a great question. Um, but it speaks, again, to this. It's, I, I can't speak to, the, to that specifically. I mean, I wish that I could do more. And, and, um, a lot of literary scholars have really gone deep into aspects of, of New English Canaan and talked about um, the verse, the poetry that Morton posts uh, on the maple, the maple which makes Bradford crazy. Um, and it's that scene in Morton's life that becomes the central figure in basically most cultural representations of Morton afterwards. So while I know about these other things, I'm sadly not an authority. Yeah, okay. so I, I appreciate the question. Sadly, I, I, it's not my, I'm not the expert on that. Thank you. Other questions? What do we know about, um, Rochelle Friedman asks, what do we know about Morton's theology? Oh, Rochelle, um, um, great question. I mean, what we know is in the latter part of New English Canaan, he criticizes aspects of, of Puritan practice. We know um, the extent that I will use the word that he was an Anglican, that, that he, you know, he really sort of embraces the Church of England animosity towards um, uh, Puritanism and the Puritans of New England. Um, 
I don't have, you know, all I can read about his theology essentially is what we can find in it, the, in the last part of the New English Canaan. Um, I don't see his um, as particularly um, intellectually adventurous there. It seems to be a fairly straightforward uh, critique. Um, the reason I'm hesitating on Anglican, uh, which is of course how I identify him in the title of my book, is when I was in England last year, I, I gave a talk about the book and I was sort of read chapter and verse that I shouldn't be using the word Anglican. Uh, and I said, well, but he's a member of the Church of England and you know, I need some term for him. And a scholar I was talking to said, well, there's a huge debate about what this term means you know, in this period. And so I, I defer. So for Shell, if the spirit of that is, did Morton contribute much to the intellectual debate about the Church of England at the time? The answer is not that I am aware of. Um, what he, where he made his contribution was really, he uses religion to make a political critique of the Puritans. I mean, and, and the pilgrims. I mean, these are people who have exiled him twice um, when he writes the book. They would exile him a third time again when he would go back. So he's really driven by personal animus. He also, um, you know, I think one thing about Morton, and I wanted to say this, you know, near the start, when I, when I emphasize at the start of this talk, I'm talking about the battle for a New England. He wants to create an England. I don't want to give people um, the impression um, that he didn't also want to change the way people live in the region. He absolutely did. Uh, he and Gorgias had had, an, had a scheme, you know, to change how people live, um, you know, and to create these fiefs. And there'd be people came over, and they would be endowed with all sorts of power. So I mean, he. It's not like he. It's not like he was some person who basically said the English should go home. He sees this region as a place to go. But he also sees it from his immersion in this place on the times that he's there, the, what I still think is the brief 1622 version, then from 1624 to 1628, then from 1629 to 1631, and then from 1644 to 1647, he dies. I do read into him um, uh, that things have gone very awry and much of the blame should be laid squarely at the Puritans. So Rochelle, what I would say, and I could be, I could be uh, naive in what I'm about to say about my reading of this, but if you contrast the tone of say Bradford's Up Plymouth Plantation, and especially, you know, the passages where he describes what the spread of disease and especially the Pequot War in 1637, you read this as we now read these texts as, as the, the, the the works of people who think providentially of the unfolding of a God's plan, and you read them, you could read them as, as Bradford or other sort of, this is it, you know, and basically these people died. They don't celebrate the deaths, it seems, although, frankly, it's hard to read his passage in Upland up, up up Station to see it as apart from that, but, but they see it as the unfolding of a plan and God destroying this proud and haughty enemy. When he writes New English Canaan, Morton doesn't know that that that's going to happen. But Morton writes, and I talk about this book, I think he writes very sensitively about this epidemic of 1616 to 1619. In the book, I, just, I follow some recent history of medicine people to think, think this is leptospirosis, this bacterial disease. I think it hits particularly hard along the coast. And it's been widely reported as this great mortality that hit indigenous New England before the English arrived at Patuxent. Morton talks about this scene of death, this newfound Golgotha, as he calls it. I read into that not, um, not a sense of punishment, which is how I read Bradford as, as a divine power punishing indigenous. I read that, again, could be a quirky reading. I read that as thinking this is a place of universal suffering, that we are not, this is not God punishing these people. It's, he doesn't particularly provide meaning about why this happens. But I think he sees a more universal experience. I think he imagines a world, I really believe this, he imagines a world where people could coexist as opposed to Bradford and others. And when you come read through a plantation, I think that the pilgrims do not think this is a place where they can coexist. Um, so is that is my reading of that passage in New English Canaan a contribution to understanding Morton's theology? 
I would say that's a stretch, but that is how I read Morton's religious views in the text that I have that I used. So uh, Mark Peterson, speaking of Yale, asks a question. If you I want you to um, talk about the problem of scale in Morton's competing vision of a New England that is gorgeous and Morton lacked and Plymouth lacked the ability to bring over colonists in large numbers and to dominate the land, resist the crown, et cetera. So could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. And, and Mark, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you asked that question. And if people who are on this call don't know it, I really urge you to read Mark's new book, which I think the colonial site has already, I have done a session on the city state of Boston, which tells you how this great yes. city where I would be with you right now emerged. The Puritans understood. Uh, and by the way, the Puritans who go to Massachusetts Bay understood how to build a colony. The pilgrims who went to New Plymouth, I know this is gonna get me in trouble next time I go back to Plymouth. I don't think we're so good at that. Plymouth never becomes a really booming area. There are several years in the 1620s, it doesn't even have a minister there. The pilgrims were there and they become famous in American war for various reasons, um, but they also couldn't really scale up their vision. Morton, it seems to me, also really lacked, he never really thought through how to build a colony, for lack of a better word. He saw himself from the start with good reason in opposition to the first the pilgrims and then to the people of Massachusetts Bay, the colonists of Massachusetts Bay, and he critiqued them and he points out what they've done wrong and he tells about the terrible things that they do. But it's not like he and Gorgeous uh, really hatch a detailed plan for what they're going to do. I mean, the minutes of the Council of New England, is, I, mean, I sort of imagine these guys meeting almost in secret, plotting, how are they gonna get the case in front of the king? Then they win, then they fit out this ship to go and they're gonna presumably shoot cannons and destroy Boston. The ship sinks before it goes anywhere. I think that's almost as far as they got. Gorgeous does sort of think, okay, here's what, what we call Maine. Here's what it's going to look like. He doesn't have long detail plans, so he could never scale it up. And Morton, you know, Morton, it's so hard. I really want to know more about Morton as a character. I mean, I find, I mean, I put very much in the beginning of this book, you know, this legal dispute he has with the children of Alice and George Miller. Um, you know, he is, he is, he's one of these people. You know, I'll tell you something, he would be a really good academic in some sense. He's one of these people who's very, very good, you know, at finding the flaws in other people. It's like what we all do when we do reader sports. Oh, wait a minute. What about blah, blah, blah. He's very good at that. He's not so good, really, at scaling up and having a, a model. And he certainly completely fails in a way to sort of build an infrastructure which existed in England time, people building infrastructure to colonize areas. He, 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 this is, if, if this was part of what he wanted to do, there seems to be no surviving trace of it. I mean, he is a frustrating figure because other than New English Canaan, his words, we don't have a lot in his voice. We know he's there. We know he's in these meetings with Gorgeous. We know that he pops up. We read him through other people. We read him through Bradford. We read him through Winthrop. We read him through other observers. We don't have a lot there. So Mark, that's a, you know, it's a great question. And it's a reminder, I think, you know, that when we talk about, I mean, one of the really important things that's come out of this 400th year and the books that have come, maybe not time to come out to it, but Mark's recent book on Boston or David Hall's amazing new book on Puritanism and then many books and articles that have come out especially last year, or I guess now I'm appearing in 2021, uh, right? we really have redefined collectively what that experience was 400 years ago. And I think that collectively as a scholarly community, we have very much shifted this from a celebration, an anniversary that we should be triumphed by look how great English colonization is into a very problematic moment of conquest away from colonization. That's been a very important collective thing. I think related to that and maybe getting a little less systematic treatment among scholars so far, but Mark's book is a good example of doing it and others have done it, is this idea, what are other possible models? Right? How did these companies work? Bob mentioned at the beginning of this talk that I'm finishing a book called American Origins. And there I'm very much looking at multiple English and other Europeans efforts to plan, how are, you, how are they gonna build colonies in North America? That's sort of the central theme of my book. 
if you know my work, um, you'll know that most of what I write about in my career is about encounters between indigenous North Americans and people from Northern Europe, primarily from mm. Britain. Um, but so it's a good question. And it, it could be that maybe Morton had great plans and Gorgeous did and we don't have them. It could be. Um, it could be that someone on this call says, you know, I have written the great book about Ferdinando Gorgeous, to which I want to say, please get that book a lot of attention mm -hmm. because Ferdinando Gorgeous, I think, could unlock a lot of the ways people in Britain mm -hmm. are thinking. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mark Valeri asks about um, Morton's descriptions of Algonquian people and how they differ from those of Purchase, Haklu, John Smith. Okay. All right. Mark, great question. Not surprised to hear a great question from you. So thanks for asking that. Um, when you look at, okay, so just to use those examples that you've mentioned. So Hacklett. Hacklett never sees North America. So Hacklett, when Hacklett describes North America, he's always using the works of other travelers, the most famous of whom is Thomas Harriet. And Harriet, who's probably known to everyone, it's called you. Harriet goes to Roanoke in 1585, writes a text published in 1588, Hacklett republishes in 1589, then the famous illustrated edition comes out in 1590 using the John White books. We have some sense of what, of what Harriet thinks about things because Harriet is there for a time. But when you go back to read um, Harriet, for example, you really get the sense of someone who wasn't there very long. Like he was there long enough to understand indigenous uh, terms, to get some understanding of the native economy uh, political system, religious ideas. You know, he does that in a year. But what you don't get through Harriet, and you don't get through, um, you don't get through Champlain, and you sort of get through Smith. You get Smith much more about Virginia than you do Smith in New England. You don't get, as Morton, I think, does in this book, tell specific stories, that sort of revealing anecdote That'll, that sort of shows to the reader. I mean, it's a, it's a rhetorical strategy, right? It's not just Morton saying, this is how other people live. It's Morton saying, I communicated with these people. I lived near these, this indigenous community. I had extensive dealings with this indigenous community. And he is doing that rhetorically so that you are gonna believe everything else he says. And it's one of the issues, it's one of the defining issues of 16th century, European exploration of the Americas, and it's the problem or the possibility of the eyewitness. Right? So it's in the 16th century and the 17th century that you see a lot of travel reports that begin with true, including Harriet's brief and true report. I was there, I am telling you the truth. And they are facing a problem. These ethnog, these reporters, these travelers are facing a problem. How do I describe this place to an audience that's never going to see it? There's a wonderful passage in, in, in Sir John Elliott's The Old World and the New, where, um, where John is contrasting, he's looking at text, and he points out the problem. People who went over them could not describe the palette that they're seeing. They did not have words to describe the colors because the colors of nature are so different from what they had in Europe. Morton, by talking about a specific relationship um, he has with a man he calls, uh, I'm going to mispronounce it, but Sheik Tabak, this man who he tells the stories, he personalizes this, he tells a story about how the Puritans desecrate the grave of this man's mother, right? and he uses this story to build confidence in the reader of his text that you can trust him, and in that sense he tries to, I think, differentiate himself from Wood, he, who Morton dismisses as a wooden prospect, right? He uses these kind of bad puns to dismiss wood. So I think, I think, you know, Morton is using these personal relationships to tell this bigger story. Hacklett never had them. Now, an interesting footnote to this, and this has come up in some of the literature about the 400th anniversary. In that early English attempt, that 1667 attempt, to go and establish a colony on the coast of Maine at Sagaduck. Right? There, it, the, the, the English take home five indigenous people, three of whom live with Ferdinando Gorgias. Right? This is not the first time English have brought native peoples back. It's not the first time Europeans have brought native indigenous Americans back. Columbus did it on his first voyage. Right? We now think of these as taking people prisoner, kidnapping them, enslaving them. It's not the word these ethnographers use. 
they, I mean, these, these writers use, they say these people came back, we, we brought them back to learn from them. Gorgeous, in fact, sort of regrets because he doesn't get all he can from the people who live with them. This presence of indigenous people in London, and this is what Carl Thrush's book called Indigenous London is good about, it's the Alden Vaughn's wonderful book, a uh, thing called Transatlantic, the Transatlantic Indians, I'm probably getting the title slightly wrong, um, you know, it's about, it's about, the, about these, indigenous North Americans in England. Um, so by the time Morton is writing, many people in England have some sense about what indigenous people like, because frankly, some English have displayed Native Americans. Um, and there's been extensive discussion of them. So Morton is writing not in a world, not to an audience that doesn't know anything. He's writing to an audience in which he has to basically say, I know more than those people. And I think it's through the use of this personal relationship and the use of anecdotes that he then can make these very pointed things. Because though, though I think New English Canaan is certainly not a great page turner, my aesthetic view, some of the stories that he tells are very powerful. And he's at his best when he's telling those personalized stories. So, and I think that comes from the fact that he writes New English Canaan after having been in North America for at least four years. So that's my gut sense. I hope, Mark, I'm sorry that went on and on, but I was trying to get the spirit of that. So. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, William Moore wants to know if in your research you came across something really surprising. He thinks you might've known what you were looking for, but what did you find in the archives that surprised you? Okay, that's a, that's a wonderful question, uh, Will. Uh, Will Orr, I, I, I think this audience doesn't know you, but since I do, I'll tell you that, that Will Orr was one of my research assistants on this project ah. for a few years as an undergraduate. And so Will was off in the archives doing research for me also. But it's so a great- So he should say, what did he find that really surprised you? Exactly, but Will, Will, I can't sing to the world the praises of your specific research finds, although I'm sure at the time they were amazing. But I can tell, here's what surprised me. Uh, and I think it is a great question. The thing that surprised me the most was, was Thomas Morton Day, to be honest. I mean, that's just such, such an unexpected twist of an ending uh, to it. What surprised me was less Morton's story than the way Morton's story was kept alive by various people in the 19th century. Hawthorne, um, not just in the story about the Maypole of Marymount, which she doesn't actually name Morton, but in another story, he does name Morton. He imagines Morton walking down the streets of Boston Morton becomes sort of a literary figure 200 years after his, his death. Uh, the persistence of Morton, the persistence of the Maypole story, I attribute that almost entirely to Up Plymouth Plantation. Um, because one of the things I talk about in the book is a Maypole to most people in England was not at all a threatening thing in the early 17th century. You know, it threatened the Puritans because it, it, there was a certain amount of chaos and disorder and willful thumbing your nose and authority in there. Uh, so finding, you know, so that story in the 17th century was not that story. But when you get the 19th century and the 20th century, that moment, that moment just defines Morton. And if he becomes, I mean, one of the surprises is, you know, he sort of becomes this, this anti-hero. He becomes sort of a hero of the, uh, what Theodore Rozak referred to as the counterculture of the 1960s. They sort of say, we're not the first Americans, I'll put that in quotes, we're not the first Americans to stand up to authority. Thomas Morton did that in the 1620s in Plymouth. The persistence of that story and the surprise to me, and really one of the reasons, one of the arguments I tried to make in the book, the surprise to me is that that story has really, I think, clouded the meaning of Morton because those exiles of Morton in 1631 and 1644, as well as from Plymouth, tell us something very important that we tend to forget. The Puritans exile Morton because Morton to them poses a threat. And in the dominant old fashioned narrative of American history, Puritans show up and everything is, obviously they are going to succeed. And there were a brilliant run of so-called New England town slaves, which people in this room will know, you know, from the 1970s into the 1980s, which take as a presumption the survival of this new English town. Well, I think that that, if you look at the way they treat Morton, I think that is a reach. I think that they are aware that their lives are not that secure, 
that they are aware that they could face a military invasion. Uh, you know, it failed, right? Uh, but I think they're aware of it. And I think what Morton's story shows is it gives us new ways of thinking about the Puritans' pilgrims to talk about their precarious existence as opposed to them as the confident conquerors and colonizers that we have become accustomed to be, uh, to see them as. I mean, and that actually, by the way, then I think helps explain some of what we look at as their deplorable, violent, genocidal behavior uh, in 1637 in capturing and enslaving indigenous people, right? I like to think, right, that if the Puritans had taken seriously, you know, the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Company, which basically says, among other things, go and bring these people into Christianity, go and live with these people, right? That it certainly was no one's original intention, not their intention in 1629, to go and have these catastrophic uh, assaults on people. I think that there is a fragility in their lives, which is a through line. I think other historians have talked about it. I didn't come up with this, but I think Morton's saga helps us see that. And so if the surprise is the persistence of the Maypole story, the lack of a surprise or whatever is, I wish this other story was just as popular. The Quo Warranto story, the winning, he wins in court, but in the end, what, I mean, what does it mean to us when the King of England says they have to return their charter, right? I mean, I had to go digging in, me, in, in, in what medieval historians have written about charters to understand this. Like, why couldn't the king just go down to the record office and say, cancel? But he needed the physical parchment back. Right? So Morton is like a witness to some of these things about how these colonies developed. Uh, and I think he's witnessed to some of the tragic aspects of the English colonial experience. A couple more questions. One from E.J. Barnes, wanting to know if anything new has been discovered about the former indentured men who were part of the Mount Williston colony. Uh, E.J., uh, uh, again, with thanks again for your fabulous image. I don't know more about that subject. I, I have not found more um, than I have. I mean, that was... You know, you know, in an ideal world, that would have been something that Jefferson and John Adams would have written to each other about. You know, I mean, it's those letters, which I really urge people, I mean, to read, are the sort of very funny intellectual sparring between those two. And it hinges on who Wollaston was and what's going on in both of these places. But if there's been recent discoveries, and maybe with the 400th anniversary, people have done more. But uh, when I was writing mine, I have to say, I didn't find more than I put in the book. It's a, it's a really great question. It's one of those, oh, I wish I knew more questions. Great. Uh, the, the Mark, Mark Peterson reminds us that the charter actually had the king's seal attached to it. So that's yeah. actually the objective representation of the king. So Correct. why you couldn't and, just go and stamp cancel on the, the and, copy and, in the record office. And when I was trying to get a picture of it, you know, which I think is in, it's in the Mass Archives or the Library. I forget now, I, I mean, I have it in my own book. I was sort of saying, I was trying to arrange with them, well, could we have a photographer come in and take a new shot of this? Because, and um, suffice to say, I failed at that. <laughs> at that. Um, that is one sacred object in Massachusetts. Um, you know, maybe they were afraid I had some secret plan to get it back to England and void everything, but um, I had no such authority. Uh, and so anyway, Mark, thanks for the clarification. Uh, you already alluded to this a little bit when uh, uh, Lynn Valeri wants to know how accessible um, New English canon is to a non-scholar. Oh, New English canon is absolutely um, accessible. I mean, you can uh, you can go to Amazon and pick up a recent uh, edition of it. Um, you can find it online. Um, you can find Charles Francis Adams' version online. Um, you can go to, if you have access to a scholarly library, you can go to uh, Early English Books Online, it will be there. But I think, Lynn, the question is not, is it available? The question is, is it accessible no. to non-specialists? I would say if you are a non-specialist who is who can be a little patient with 17th century writing, some of which will seem somewhat plodding or overblown, um, I wouldn't call it an elegant text. And what I, and the bits that I've talked about, uh, the political critique at the end, the stories of his friendship with this one man, uh, are nuggets. 
it's, it's really a text you can read across. But I think Charles Francis Adams was right in the sense that it is very hard for anyone, hundreds of years or, to understand everything that Morton was talking about because there's so much embedded in this text um, that, is, that is hard to see. So for example, can one read it cover to cover and get much from it? Yes. Can one read it cover to cover and trust Morton's observations about nature, which is by the way, how a lot of people mm -hmm. use the book now. In fact, I was struck, you, may, you guys in Massachusetts may know, there was a study of the Harvard Forest that came out uh, in I think nature last year or two years, it's two years ago now, about did native peoples burn forests. Uh, when Harvard ran a new story about the piece, the author referred to Morton, like pulled Morton up, which the author had gotten via changes in the land. As I say, Morton is used, but if you want to pick up the text and read it and understand all of the allusions, I think that's rather hard. And I think that's what Charles Francis, that was the genius of Charles Francis Adams. Besides putting the text back in to wider, wider circulation, I don't know how many people were in the print society, I think it's by a fairly limited number. He recognized the sort of depth of it. So I think it's one of these texts. I know that uh, Mary Fuller was on this call before. Mary is like the you know, most brilliant reader of Hacklet. You know, you can sit and read Hacklet. I spent a lot of time reading Hacklet, but you sometimes need, you know, a, a concordance in some sense to read, to understand all of the specific references in it. I think New English Canaan is like that. I think you can come away with it with certainly an understanding, but I think there are enough embedded references in it that it's not the most accessible text. In that sense, Bradford's text is much more accessible than Morton's. Um, and the Colonial Society's new edition, just a shout out, is a phenomenal resource um, along those lines. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, Elijah Gould and Karen Kupperman actually have asked kind of related questions, which I think will give you a break after this. Um, okay. Although we could, you, you look like you're ready to go all night though. Um, well, remember, but, it's, only four, it's only five o'clock for me here. So, oh, yeah. okay, great, great. Then the evening is young. Um, so why did Morton want to change New England as opposed to just going somewhere else? And then uh, should we assume that he actually was definitely interested in founding a colony or were there other relationships with America maybe that he was pursuing? Well, okay, so, so Lodge and Karen, um, those are great questions. Um, I believe, I mean, and now I'm in the hypothetical, this is sort of what does the author believe because I'm beyond what the texts take me. You know, from reading through his fairly close partnership with Gorgias, uh, through the first half of the 1630s. I think that there's little question that had Gorgias succeeded and rechristened New England as Gorgiana, one of the clans, uh, Morton would have played some leading role in it. I like to believe that Morton would have sort of lived up to the spirit of New English Canaan and tried to create more positive relations. But this sort of goes back to the question that Mark Peterson asked earlier. I don't really have systematic evidence of Morton trying to organize a colony. What we have in New English Canaan, my read of New English Canaan is, again, I referred to this before, the genre of the travel narrative. We have a, a text, which is in many ways a classic travel narrative, which becomes in some ways a shopping list. It's sort of pointing out, if you get to this place, look at all the things you can find. Now, Morton is not the first person who does that for this region we call New England. John Smith, in fact, had done that in his text. And other people had talked about what was there before. Um, and, or, and many explorers had been to this region and they had told their stories. So, you know, how do you then read through what is essentially a gap in the archive, or at least if there's a lot out there that I missed, I hope someone will write that book and I will rethink my Morton, you know, the Morton that I've created in this book or that I tried to describe in this book. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that, you know, he has this correspondence with Gorgias, you know, where they sort of talk about, they would put this different scheme in place and they would reward political favorites and they would create these, these tracts. And there are these early maps of what Gorgias had in mind. They were gonna, they plot out, um, you know, what this area is going to look like under them, but they do that you know, this is actually sort of a central theme of things I've been thinking about a lot. And I think a lot of us have thought about recently, you know, what is the relationship between Europeans who never leave Europe? Let's talk about Eng Britons who never leave England um, and North America. You know, they have these vast claims, these 
paper claims, right? Through, you know, basically, essentially following the spirit of Columbus of, you know, discovery, whatever that means. So we all know, well, these, they're not the first people there. But they, these early maps uh, and people like, and Karn's work is so great on understanding 16th century North America. And Karn's like, I aspire to have the impact of Karn's work. You know, these maps are basically, you know, in many senses, they're fictions, right? They're imaginative colonial or imperialist fantasies, you know, that they're going to fill this area. I mean, I can tell you that if, you know, I don't think that Sir Fernando Gorges or, or Thomas Morton would have understood uh, what the interior of what is now the state of Maine, you know, was like, you know, would they have imagined a series of towns that would look like a New England town with the premise that English people should really live amongst themselves with natives pushed to the side? Did he imagine that there really could be coexistence? I mean, you have to infer a fair amount. Uh, and, and here I think it's important for me uh, um, to, to stipulate and I think this is true for many of us who write, you know, micro historical kinds of texts. There was a recent review of the book in the New York Review of Books, in which it was a wonderful view by Christopher Benfey, you know, in which he basically says, look, here is a, here's a view of Morton, which is not unbiased, right? And it is true. Um, you know, I do see certain positive things about Morton's perspective, but it is, it is, it does not go to the extent would he have actually succeeded because he does not lay that out. He is, again, he's a critic. Uh, he knows how to suck up to authority. He's kind of brilliant at that, right? I mean, imagine the scene, right? In the 1620s, he's fighting over an estate in Swallowfield. So Swallowfield's a small village in Wiltshire and he's fighting over that and he leaves. There's an allegation of murder against him, which Winthrop knows about, right? Within a few years, his case is in front of the King of England and he wins. He and Gorgeous win, right? That is an unlikely trajectory. So what would have happened had he gone back and been able to sort of put plans in? If Gorgeous had made the commitment to really create it, Agamenticus does not, my understanding of the documents, does not become a big flourishing settlement. Yes, it's where York, Maine is, is now. Uh, but when Morton is there, it is a very small place, and Gorgeous's interests are elsewhere. And I, and I think what we as who are interested in this area, Americanists need to remember, is that the people whose works we're using, so, someone like Gorgeous, for example, a lot of these people are interested in lots of parts of the world. They're not just interested in America, right? And so it's a ten. I mean, the tendency of American historians, and I, I am a complete victim of this trap, to sort of emphasize the American nature of it. So when I wrote a book about Hacklet, for example, I talked about it as an obsession, right? You know, I meant that in the sense of an obsession as a, as a sort of transitory phase that Hacklet was all in sort of until he wasn't. Because as I point out in my book on Hacklet, Hacklet loses interest. Hacklet's interests go elsewhere. He thinks the future is in the Southwest Pacific. Gorgeous and these people, a lot of these people in these circles in London, they're invested all over the place. They're invested, they're interested in the East Indies. They're interested in Africa. Morton, we don't have enough documentary evidence to know the range of interest that I imagine he knew about, but I don't know how involved he was. So this all goes to the question, I don't know what kind of a colony he might have actually been able to found is a strong word, but whatever, help engineer. Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter. This has been fascinating and it's great to see you and Again, The Trials of Thomas Morton, an Anglican lawyer, his Puritan foes in the battle for a New England, which is published by Yale University Press. And uh, we do have a discount coupon available. If uh, you didn't see it in the chat, you can send an email to me at the Colonial Society and we will make sure you get it. So thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Bob, and thank you for the questions, everybody. Yes, okay, uh, you, yeah, okay. we've just put in the chat, receive, you know, Y-E-T-T-M is how to order at YaleBooks.com. So, great to see you, Peter, thank you. Thank you, Bob, thank you to everybody else. Have a good night. You too, thanks.